Hi, welcome to another video. Hope you're doing well, hope you're ready for something that we're going to talk about frequently, which is, which is graphs. And right now in this video, we're going to learn about some features of graphs, namely points, domain, and range. So while this isn't going to be a, a whole long, exhaustive list of things we can do with graphs, it's really nice to be able to start with how graphs work and what, what really is being asked. Because some of the terminology, while it's not difficult to do, can be a little confusing. So we're going to talk about how to find points in a graph, what they mean when they're asking all of these questions. We'll talk about domain and range quite a bit. I'll also give you some very interesting examples where students get confused on why in the world the domain is this. Uh, and what, what that really means for a graph. And it's very important to get what the domain is correct in your head. So we'll talk about that for a little bit. We'll also talk about how to do this without a graph if you need to find this information without the actual picture of the function itself. So that's the lesson uh, for, for this video. And then we'll continue next time to talk about some more features. So let's get right to it. When we talk about graphs, graphs, of course, are this 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 uh, this representation of every point that satisfies a function that you're given. So we have an infinite number of points, but sometimes what's going to be asked is, well, what about some specific points? So what about f of zero? What in the world does that mean? Well, what that is talking about when they're asking you f of zero or f of negative six, it says the functions the function itself is going to give you an output value. We plug in a value, we get an output out. So input output. And this is saying, what is the function's output value? So the output of the function equals what when your input value is zero? In other words, all this is really asking you to do is to complete a point. So if we look at our graph and say, what do you mean by complete a point? If the input is zero, it's saying, what's the output of the function given that your input is zero? It's saying, complete this point. Here's your input of zero. Find me the output. So we look at our graph and go, okay, um, here's my input, my x is my input axis. Here's my input of zero. My output of my graph is zero, five. Notice how the point's given for you. You just had to find it. So this is saying, um, complete this point, really. If your input is zero, your output has to be five for this given function. So this answer would be five. You can just complete a point, and that's what that's asking you to do. Same thing with uh, f of negative six. It says, find me the output's value. The, the output of the function at, at an input of negative six. So when we go to our input axis, our x axis, we go, here's our negative six. Let's go up or down to where we meet the function. Let's find the point. Let's complete the point with an x in an uh, input of negative six. So here's negative six, here's negative six, negative three. So really would say, if you want to complete this point, just find the point on the graph that has an x value of negative six and the output would be negative three. That's what we're talking about here. So really, this is asking you to find points on the graph. It says, find me the output when your input's zero. Find me the output when your input's negative six. Find that function's output. It's saying complete the point with an x value of zero, negative six respectively. Um, kind of similar is this f of three. So let's find f of three, where that would be, and just determine whether our output is positive or negative. So anytime they're talking about f of something, f of x, f of whatever, it's an output idea. So it's saying, I want you to, to look at the y value of whatever x value you're inputting. So find me a point on the graph that has an output, or sorry, where the output is given by an input of three. So, so in other words, we're gonna go to the input value of three. So f of three, here's our x value of three. Find where the function is. Is it above or below? Well, if we had to put a point on this graph where we would have three comma something, an input value of three and then whatever output, it'd be up here somewhere. Well, it looks like it's about four. It's not asking you whether it's four or not. It's asking, is the output value positive or negative? And that's what it's saying. It says, given an input value of three, what's the function doing? What's its output? Is it positive or is it negative? Since we're above the x-axis, all of these output values are positive. This would just be positive. For f of eight, we do the same thing. We go, all right, well, tell, tell me what the output is. Uh, if our input is eight, the function is gonna give us some sort of an output for the input of eight. I'm gonna go to my x-axis for an input of eight, and it's asking, is that output value positive or negative? Well, when we look at eight, it says, I wanna, I wanna complete a point where we have eight comma something. It's actually done for you. Here is eight comma negative three. And we go, all right, well, I could actually fill that point in. It's, it's negative three, it's given to me on that graph. But what we're concerned about is the output value positive or negative? Is it above or below the x-axis? Well, our y values are all negative here. So given an input of eight, 
f of 8 is asking you what's the output value for the input. So basically complete the point. In this case, it's just asking you, is that output positive or negative? We're clearly negative. Hope that's making sense so far. That's kind of the basics of, of how they ask you what points are on a graph. They, they say, find me the output value for an input. It just looks a little bit funny. They're not asking specifically like that. We can also do things like for what values of x is f of x equal to zero. Now, now here's where we really have to understand what the function notation means. This says, I want you to look for outputs of zero, not, not inputs of zero. I'm not plugging in zero. I'm not letting x equal zero. We've already done that. We know that if x is zero, our output's five. We're done. What this is saying is uh, think differently. Think about every time where you have an output of zero. So, so really, you could do this. You could say, I want to find points where my output is zero. Notice how points are set up. Points are always set up x comma f of x. And now I'm saying, I want you to find me some points where this number over here is zero. How many points do that? Well, all of those points, now get this, this is important. All of those points are going to be on the x-axis. All of those points are going to say, hey, here's an f of x of 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Here's an f of x of 0. This whole horizontal line represents points where your output would be 0. And this is saying, I want you to complete points, what's your x, when your output is 0. It's saying find x-intercepts. This is just a way that they have you do that. So when they say find all the values where f of x is equal to 0, it's saying find all the values where your output is 0. Find all the values on the x-intercept, on the x-axis. Find all the values that are x-intercepts. That's what that's saying. So it's complete this point. Well, there's a, there's a few of them. We have negative 4 and output of 0. Hey, that's an x-value where your output is 0. 6 where your output is 0, and 10 where your output is 0. So for what x's is this output 0? For what x's do we have x-intercepts? We'd say there's negative 4. 6 and 10. Those are the x values where we have an output of 0 on our graph. So we have this negative 4, that's on the x-axis, that has an output of 0, and 6 and 10. You can write it like this. Me personally, I really prefer to write points, so I'd probably take this a little further and say, well, we'd have negative, they don't specifically ask this, though. they say, well, for what, it, what x value is that? I just like to make sure that my students know that those values are giving you x-intercepts, and x-intercepts are points on a graph. They, they really are. Now, we oftentimes just put x's, and that's, that's totally fine. We all understand that x equals negative 4 is now an x-intercept. It said, hey, your output's 0. You're on the x-axis. No problem. X-intercept. And, and that's, that's OK. Uh, but I want to make sure you understand they are points. So negative 4, 0, 6, 0, 10, 0 are x-intercepts on that graph where a graph crosses the x-axis. Okay, I hope this is making sense. I hope you understand right now that really this is just asking you to complete a point where your x is 0, find the y. Your x is negative 6, find the y or f of x. Your x is 3, is, it, is the output positive or negative? Uh, your x is 8, is the y value, f of x value, positive or negative? This is different. And this is saying um, now your y value, your f of x value is 0. Find the x's that make that happen. So we're at 0, oh, negative 4, 0, okay, 6, 0, okay, 10. We're thinking about it differently. How about the next one? For what values is f of x greater than 0? This causes a lot of confusion in, in a lot of students because what students want to do is they want to follow this graph up and they go, oh, well, I mean, our, we're, we're greater than 0 between 0 and 5, obviously, because that's how, that's how we're climbing. When, when we understand functions, what functions deal with? Functions deal with uh, um, almost exclusively, the only one that doesn't really is range, uh, this idea of intervals on the x-axis. You see, x is our independent variable. X is what drives everything in our function. So, so when we think about that, we think, here's how, this, here's how this is really better worded. For what interval of your x-axis is your graph positive? For what interval of your x-axis is your graph above? the x-axis. That's what this is asking. So when we think about this, you can't go this way. You go, all right, for what interval on the x-axis am I above it? Um, well, let's think about it. Are the, is this range of your function, or sorry, this, uh, I'll say piece. Is this piece of your function above the x-axis? Is it positive? Well, well, no. We know that the graph is above the x-axis starting probably right here and ending right here. 
And what we've just done is marked off the piece, the interval of the x-axis where the function is positive. That's exactly what this is asking. Find me the x values where your function's positive. That's this interval of x's. That's what that's asking you. It says, give me the piece of the x-axis where I'm above the x. It's not a this way idea. It's a x-axis idea. Almost everything we talk about is an x-axis idea. We find x-intercepts. Well, intercept, we got that, but we have an x x interval here that says for the, the interval of numbers between x equals negative 4 and x equals 6, my graph is going to be positive. And we have two ways to write that. So we're going to say, all right, um, you know what? One way I could write this, for what x is, is my, my function positive? Well, you already know how to find positive, right? You knew that at 3 we were positive, at 8 we were negative. This is saying find, find a whole range of them whole interval of them. So our interval from negative 4 to 6 is going to give me positive outputs. The way we write that is from negative 4 to 6. Those are the values of x's, right? We said, hey, all, all this whole range from negative 4, x is somewhere between here to 6, we're going to get positive outputs. That's exactly what the question is asking you. The other way that we can write this is with something called interval notation. In my opinion, it's not the best notation because it ends up looking a lot like points, but it is one way that we can represent this and you need to know it. So the other way that we can write this is, hey, you know what, From um, if I want to write the x values from negative 4 to 6, I can also write it like this. The interval of the x-axis where we have positive outputs is from x equals negative 4 to x equals 6, but, but not quite equal. You see, if we let this equal, notice, if we let this equal, I'm really not positive at this point right there. At that point, I'm not positive, I'm not negative, I'm zero. Well, that's not what this is asking you. This is saying, where is your graph strictly positive, not equal to zero, or we would include the negative 4, we would include the 6. That's not what it's telling you. It's saying, I want you to be strictly positive. And that says, well, I can't really include those x-intercepts because at an x-intercept, I'm equal to zero. And I don't want to be equal to zero. I want to be positive. So we can't include that. For that reason, we'd show this interval with what are called parentheses. This represents the same exact thing. This says, hey, uh, the x values for which your function is positive is negative 4 to 6, but not including those two endpoints or negative 4 to 6, but not including those two endpoints. To include them, we use a bracket. And I'll show you that when we talk about the domain. OK, how about the, you should try this right now. What about the function? Where is the function less than 0? Oh, you know what? I, I missed one. Sorry. Where is the function greater than 0? We have one interval. I talked about that. But there's also this other one right over here. We go, well, yeah, we're not, we're not above the x-axis here. That's, that's below. That's, that's outputs that are negative. We're above the x-axis, or our outputs are positive from negative 4 to 6. Eh, not between 6 and 10, but then from 10 to 11, we're, we're also positive. So the way we're going to write that, I'll write this all together, is we have this. We also have an interval right here from 10 to 11. This little interval, not up and down, but x-axis wise. We say the x values that are given us positive outputs are also found from 10 to to 11. So this is one way we can write it with, uh, with this inequality notation. We can also say, all right, so interval notation, we go negative 4 to 6, no problem. And then we also go from 10 to 11. And that little u there is a union. It's saying this interval combined with this, or this interval or this interval are going to give you values that are positive. Our outputs are positive. I hope that, that you're sticking with me here. I hope that's making sense to you. You're seeing the interplay between the x intervals and the outputs. And we're always, pretty much always, talking about the x interval when we're talking about increasing and decreasing. We're talking about, and we haven't done that yet, when we're talking about positive versus negative functions, we're talking about domain. We'll be getting that in a second. All right, now we're ready to go ahead and look at what. What interval of x axis is our function below zero? So same question, only in reverse. And you could probably see it right now. You should be doing this. We notice that our function is below the x axis here and again over here. What we're going to look at it is what interval of the x axis gives us outputs that are negative? What interval of the x axis has my graph below the x axis? Well, that looks like it's from negative 6 
to negative 4. Same idea if we're, <laughs> I kind of figure, if we're not above and we're not constant, we're not at zero, then we're below. So the intervals that we didn't just mark off for being above the x-axis probably are going to give us below. That would be negative 6 to negative 4. And we can do it both ways. So negative 6 to negative 4 give us an interval on the x-axis where we are negative. Also, from 6 to 10. That gives us an interval on the x-axis where our outputs are below the x, or negative. If we want to write interval notation really similar, we're going to do negative 6 to negative 4. We're going to do parentheses because, again, we're not equal to. We're not saying less than or equal to. We're saying strictly negative. If I let the equals go, I'd include those values. But here, I can't include the values negative 6, negative 4, 6, or 10 because that would give us a 0. And I'm saying I don't want to be equal to 0. I want to be strictly less than that. I want to be negative. We'd also go from 6 to 10. And we show that with parentheses and our, our just strict inequalities thereof of less than. That's got to make sense before we go any further. We've got to understand how to find some points and how, what they mean by that. We've got to find positive and negative and what they mean by saying, hey, what's your output value when your x is such and such? We've got to really understand what this is about. When they're saying f of x equals a number, they're saying, I want you to find x values that give, get, give me, that yield that output value. So this is saying, I want you to find x's when my output is zero, no problem. This is saying, I want you to give me the interval of the x-axis where I am positive or the interval of the x-axis where I'm negative. It's not an up and down idea. No, we want that to be the case. It's an interval of the x idea. It's always from this x to this x. All right, moving on a little bit. What the domain means, and we, we talked about this in another video. The domain is this idea of what inputs I can plug into a function and get an output. Well, graphically what that means is what section of the x-axis does my graph cover? What interval of the x-axis does my graph cover? That is what the domain means. So it's a very one-dimensional back and forth idea. So domain says, all right, look at my function. Tell me the, x, tell me the entire interval of the x-axis this thing covers. And we see it right away. The interval that, the, that this graph covers on the x-axis, so our domain, our inputs, our x-axis is our input axis, says our graph covers what portion of that? Well, it's from negative 6 to 11. That's the section of the x-axis from here to here. And it covers all of this. I think I just ruined that pen. Oh, well. So that is what the domain means. It says, just give me the inputs. What are inputs? Well, x's. What that means is that the, what are the values that are giving me actual outputs? All right, well, that would be a section or an interval of the x-axis that's giving me some sort of a graph. In other words, what's the graph cover? The graph covers on the x-axis from negative 6 to 11. So we can write it like this. We have that x such that we, we remember the set builder notation x such that x is between negative 6 and 11. Notice the difference here. I used something that I didn't use over here. Over here was strict inequalities because we wanted to be less than 0. We didn't want our function to equal 0 or greater than 0 as the case may be. Here we're saying, well, no, 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 no. Give me every value of x that gives me an output. Well, does negative 6 and does 11 give you an actual output? Yes. And so we have to include those values. The way we do that is with a less than or equal to and with a parenthesis, well, I'm sorry, instead of a parenthesis, with a bracket. So when we're talking about domain and we have an actual physical point where we are ending, we're going to say, I want to include that. I want to make sure that my set building notation has an equals saying, yes, this value is included in my domain. In my set of inputs, it's giving me an actual real numbered output. My graph is on those values. So there, or we can do interval notation and say, hey, we're going between those values and including them. That's what that bracket does. Range is the idea, a little bit harder to do because we're because we can go back and forth looking at it vertically. Um, domain's a little bit easier because we're looking at the x-axis saying, hey, you can only cover it at one point, but 
With range, it's a little, little more challenging because we can cover part of the y-axis and then cover it again. Uh, we don't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one function. X-axis is just vertical line test passes. This is a function. Every single vertical line is going to cross our graph one time, no matter what, like x equals 3. Okay, that's only one output value. And so it's kind of easy to see, hey, this, this graph covers this part of my x-axis. Range says, tell me what... Tell me what section, what interval of the y-axis, or f of x axis, my graph covers. My graph gives me outputs there. So we're looking on both sides here, figuring out, well, what section of the y does this graph cover? I'm not, I'm only going on the y. Notice how on the, on the domain, I didn't go off of the x-axis at all. Same thing with the range. I cannot let my pen move off of this y-axis. So I'm looking, what's my lowest value on the y? What, what, output does that cover? Well, it covers down to negative three. All of these outputs are covered somewhere. It doesn't matter how many times they're covered. I don't care. That's what makes it a little challenging is making sure you're covering it. And then, okay, the highest value we're getting is five. So the interval that we cover on the y-axis is from negative three to five. That is what the range means. And we can use y, we can use f of x, You'll see both. Here we probably should use that f of x, but I want to make sure I give that to you. And we'd say all the output values can be found between negative 3 and 5, including those. Notice how we actually attain a negative 3. We actually attain a 5. So we have to show that with that less than or equal to. We also have to show that with brackets. Okay, now how about x-intercepts? Well, wait a minute. X-intercepts. X-intercepts are where the function, the function outputs would be zero. The function outputs would be someone down here. You've already done that. When you find f of x equals zero, you are finding x-intercepts if they exist. So this is a redundant question. So we'd say, hey, where our function's value was zero, where our output height was zero, we'd be on the x-axis. We already found the x is where that's the case. So this is basically kind of reinforcing that, hey, you know these numbers over here? Yeah, that's what you're finding. So your x-intercepts are negative 4, 0, 6, 0, 10, 0. Now, can a function have more than one x-intercept and still be a function and pass vertical line test? Of course. Can a function have more than one y? intercept and still be a function. No, that would fail the vertical line test. That would fail the idea of, hey, one input needs to give you exactly one output. So your y-intercept, there needs to be only one of them, if, if there even exists one. So the y-intercept is where we cross the y-axis. We cross the y-axis right here at 0, 5, and that's what that's asking for. Notice how every single y-intercept is going to have an x value of 0. Of course, yeah, it's got to be on the axis, just like every Y at X intercepts going to have a Y value of zero. All right, last couple here. How many times does the Y equal two line cross the graph? Well, Y equals two. Let's see. Y equals two. Here's here's the Y axis. Here's here's two. Y equals two would be a constant. So how many times does that horizontal line cross our graph? I don't care where it crosses. It's just asking how many times it crosses. That would be two times. That's what that's asking you. Last one. Students get super confused about those. They go, I, I, I understand the x-intercept idea. You go, yeah, yeah. If I said equal to zero, I'm just find out where we cross the x-axis. But how I introduce that to you, I said, really think about this as you're trying to complete some points. Trying to complete a point where your output is zero. Find me the input. It says, I don't know the x. Find me the input when your output's zero. Okay, here's my output of zero, output of zero, output of zero. I'd have an input of negative four, an input of six, and an input of ten, and that would give me my outputs of zero. This is doing the same thing. It's saying, for what x does f of x equal three? It's saying, complete the point where your output is three. Every time we say f of x equals three, it's saying, I want that output to be three. So do we have some points where we have a three? Well, let's see. Uh, 3 is positive. 3 is going to be above our x-axis somewhere, so I'm looking above here. 
looking for my y value or f of x value of three, and I'm saying, oh, wait a minute. Hey, here's a y value of three right there. Here's a y value of three. Here's another y value of three. Oh, there's two points. Is it okay to have two points? Yeah, sure. It says for what x's does this work? It's okay to have more than one. In our case, this says um, negative two would give me an output of negative uh, positive three and four would give me an output of three. So I'm looking for the x value that's causing my function to have an output value of three. Complete the point. Here's negative two and here is four. If you didn't have these points listed, it'd kind of be a guessing game unless you have a rectangular coordinate showing you this. So we'd have to sort of guess, well, here's my, here's my output of three, and we'd go over and say, my output of three has a, oh, an input of four. My output of three also has an input of negative two. You'd have to do it that way. Last one you should be doing on your own. Give me, give me some x values or complete the point that says I want the function's output. This is an output of negative three. So I'm gonna say, looks like two points. You should be finding those two points right now. Just think, maybe thinking in your head. There's two of them. You say, well, what is my, what's an input value that's gonna be giving me an output of negative three or find the input that gives me the output of negative three. Um, here's negative three, we could go over. We hit our graph here, a point's already listed for us. We say an input value of eight is what's giving me the output. This way, an input value of negative six is what's giving me the output. We've completed that point. Input value of negative six. I hope that's made sense. That's a lot about graphing. As far as what the points mean, what they mean, what what, the, what it looks like to ask what a point is on a graph. And that's what that's doing. Uh, saying, find me the input if I give you an output. Over there. Find me the output if I give you an input. Complete those points. We talked about what x-intercepts are, what that looks like, what it means when they're asking you f of x equals zero. We also talked about domain and range. So the section of the x-axis your graph covers, that's your domain. Section of the y-axis your graph covers, that's your range. I'm gonna come back in just a second. We'll talk about some sort of tricky problems with domain and range. We'll get more into that. I'm not gonna ask you about points anymore. And then I'll show you how to do this stuff without a graph. All right, let's get after it. So on these four graphs, we're just going to be talking about domain, we're talking about range, just making sure that we really understand that it's a big deal. So what the domain means is the, the portion, the section, the interval of the x-axis that your graph covers. So we're just looking at the x-axis. You should know very quickly. Uh, what this says is that, hey, you know what? If I look at my first graph, the section of the x-axis is from here to here. I don't care that it's pi and negative pi. It's a little, little, it looks a little strange for us, but it's just a trig function. We'll talk about that when we get trigonometry, no problem. But our domain, and that's huge to know what the domain is for trig functions, is from negative pi to pi. The interval of the x-axis that my graph covers is negative pi to pi. Now think, am I going to be using equals and brackets or not? Well, the points are included. So I would say we have x's from negative pi, including that value, to pi. Interval notation would just be negative pi to pi with brackets. The range, the interval of the y-axis or f of x-axis that our graph is covering says, well, we have the smallest value of negative one and the largest value of one, and we're covering everything in between there. So for our range, we have y values such that we're going from negative one, those are always in order, to one, including those values because those points actually exist there. And interval notation says from negative one to one. I hope that's making sense. The interval of the x-axis that our graph covers, that's domain. Interval of the y-axis our graph covers, that's our range. If we take a look at this one, I'm gonna do this one next. The interval of the x-axis that our graph covers. Uh, some students get really confused with the errors and go, oh, I'm going up, I, I must follow this up. Think about the x-axis only. So if you think I can only move my pencil across this, just one dimensionally, not two dimensionally, just one dimensionally, how far will I eventually go? Well, eventually, my pencil is going to have covered everything in here, so this whole section, but it'll cover everything this way, and it will eventually cover everything this way. Notice, this graph is continuous, it's shown to continue like this. It will eventually, though, 
cover the entire x-axis. So because the domain is the interval of the input axis, our x-axis, that our graph covers, this graph will ultimately cover the entire x-axis. That needs to make sense to you. So this is everything from negative infinity to positive infinity. How we show that, we can say x such that x is probably just all real numbers. Uh, we could write all real numbers. We could write um, negative infinity less than x less than infinity. If you, want, if you do write that, don't include the equals because we can't ever reach that infinity just as it goes forever, basically. Um, don't include the equals. We always have parentheses. We always have strictly less than for infinities. or we simply put all real numbers. Now, is the range going to cover, sorry, is this graph going to cover the entire range of our y-axis? No, no, this is a horizontal asymptote, and this is an exponential function. I tried to write e to the x for you. Um, you probably have seen that at some point, but this is a, at least an exponential function, and it has a horizontal asymptote, which means as it's coming from this way, it came from being really, 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 really close to zero. And if you look at it going to the left, it's going to get really, 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 really close to zero as we approach negative infinity. But it never hits that zero. So as far as a range is concerned, we're not covering the entire y-axis. We're basically covering from zero upward. Remember, this is a one-dimensional idea. X-axis, you can only go back and forth. Y-axis, you can only go up and down. So we're covering from zero, but not including it, and then to infinity. So our y values are y such that y is greater than or zero is less than y to infinity. We can't include the zero because we never actually attain it. We just get really, really close to that. That idea is super important for us to accurately find the domain on problems like these two, like with that open circle and what's that mean? We'll talk about that in a second. Or from zero to infinity. So the section of the x-axis that our graph covers domain, we got that down. Y-axis is our range. Now, when we get to problems that look like this, they're a little funky because what that open circle means is that that point is missing. We get right up to it. It's called the removable discontinuity. Most of the time in calculus, we call it that. This says, yeah, there's, there's an endpoint here, but this endpoint is missing. So how in the world are we going to, going to define our domain, the section of our x-axis that our graph covers, if we're missing a point? Well, well, let's look at it. What section of the x-axis do we actually cover? I think we all agree. Well, on the x-axis, we're only going left and right, one-dimensionally. It includes everything from here, including that zero, and then it goes all the way up to the four. It includes things like 3.9, 3.999, 3.999999999 .9 for a really long time. It just doesn't include the four. Think about it. That's very similar to what this did. This would have values of like 0 0.00000000001 as an output. It just would never attain the zero. How we show that is with parentheses. We say it's really close, but it never really gets there. This is really close to four, but it never really gets there. All right, it's going to be a parenthesis around the four. It says that we get really close to it, as close as you can get without touching it, but we don't include the actual value. So that's that point. I mean, so close. It just it doesn't include the four. You don't stop at three. You don't stop at 3.9. That's not nearly close enough. We can go way closer, and that's what the parenthesis tells us. It says that we're very close, but we just do not include it. It's basically excluding one point, just the end point. So our domain here says two ways. Number one, the section of the x-axis that our graph covers starts at zero, and we include it. There's an actual point there, and it ends at four, but we disinclude it. There is not a point at the four. Do you notice the, the two inequalities we're using? We see, yep, we actually can attain the zero. The section of the x-axis has a point there, and then we say, uh, well, up to four, but not including that, because at that four, we're, we're missing the point. Don't, don't miss the point. So we're, we get really, really, really close, but that point is missing. So the section of the x-axis that we're actually covering stops. It gets really, it actually doesn't really stop. Um, it gets really, really, really close to, to four, as close as possible without including it. Or interval notation says zero to four with a bracket around the zero because we do include it on the x-axis, but not four. 
The range is quite similar. You probably can do this on your own. As far as the range is concerned, the section of the y-axis that we're covering is from zero to five. So look at it this way. So just turn your head like that. And we have another number line saying, yeah, we're in, we're gonna, I'm gonna erase that. We're, we are including that zero. Sure, that is an output value that we actually attain, but we don't really get an output of five so close to it. Input of four, we almost get that. Output of five, we almost get that. We're so close, 4.99999. But to show that, we say that the section of our y-axis that we actually cover is from zero, including it, but up to five. Okay, and the last one, maybe try it on your own. I want you to think about what section of the x-axis your graph covers. What section of the y-axis will your graph ultimately cover? As far as the x-axis, this graph has a, this is like a logarithm, uh, this graph has a vertical asymptote. So while it gets really close to zero, does it ever actually touch x equals zero? Notice domain is a strictly on the x-axis idea. You just look at this graph saying, hey, if I superimpose a graph on my x-axis, it's going to cover from here all the way up to here. That's all we're doing. That the, end of the section of the x-axis your graph is covering is this section of the x-axis. Well, that's from zero. to seven, but I can't include either the zero because I never get, I never get an, I'm not allowed even to put an input in there. There's no output from that zero. And so that's not a valid input because it's not giving us an output for this graph. Also seven, I can't include the seven because it's not a valid input that's giving us a valid output. It's not giving us an output. So we can't include it saying, hey, you know what the domain is? The domain is a set of inputs that are giving us outputs. If zero is not giving us an output and seven not, is not giving us an output, we can't include them. So we're going to show that we disinclude them. Or from zero to seven, interval notation. Idea for the y-axis, the range, the section of the, the y-axis that your graph covers, this is going all the way down to negative infinity. So we're going from negative infinity all the way up to 12, but we don't include either one. So we can't it says there's not an actual output at negative infinity because you can't ever get there. There's not an actual output of 12 because that point is missing, but we get really close. And that's the two ways I can explain the, the, the getting there idea. Uh, the, we don't include it. So we have some y values that are from negative infinity. And we get almost to 12. That's what that means. Or we get to a valid output that's just before 12, but we can't include that because 12 is not a valid output for us. And likewise for interval notation, negative infinity to 12. I hope that's made sense. I hope that graph, I want to be done with graphs for now. I hope that graphically you understand the domain and the range idea. Students get really confused with domain and range. They don't understand what it is because it's never taught to them very well. Like, hey, what domain is for a graph is just the section of the x-axis that this is actually covering. If you have if you have inputs that are not giving you outputs or not giving you valid outputs, then you must not include them. And we do that with the parentheses. Lastly, what if you don't have a graph? Can we still do some things if we don't have a graph? Yeah. Um, it might not be as easy, sometimes a little bit easier, but let's go through and, and see if we can find some things that are similar to what we've done, such as, hey, can you find points? Can you find points where you have an output given, not an input? Can you find the domain, x-intercepts, and y-intercepts? So some of the big ideas here. If I ask you for f of 1, remember what that means. This says, here's f of x, f of an input value, and I want your input value to be 1. Okay, so what I'm asking you to do is complete the point where your input value is one. That's what I'm asking. If I plug in one, if I evaluate for one, well, that's doing it. This says find me an output value for x. Here's the formula for doing that. Find me an output value when x is one. So one plus two is three. One minus six is negative five. We have negative three fifths. In other words, I'm just asking you to complete a point 
just like we did from, for graphs. But instead of a graph, a picture of the, the function, I'm going to give you the actual formulaic algebraic way to, to manipulate that. So you plug in one, you get an output, you complete the point. Now, this is probably the hardest one. Uh, what, what if I say, now I don't want you to find an output given an input. This says, I want you to find me an input. Notice what that is. It says your, your inputs give you your total output. So it says the output of a function, here's my function, where my input values are x. Here's, I want you to find me the output where my input value is 1. We plugged in 1. It says, I want you to find me, oh wait, I want you to have an output of 2. Find me the input. It says, I don't know my x. I'm looking for my input value when my output is 2. Look at the way that your function is designed. It's designed very well. It says, can you replace f of x with 2? Well, wait a minute. Here's f of x. Can I replace this whole thing? It says, this piece, your output, this is 2. So we'd say, all right, if f of x equals x plus 2 over x minus 6, and I tell you that I want that output to be 2, I literally say f of x is x plus 2 over x minus 6. Now f of x is 2. I can replace the f of x with that too. And then I can solve for x. We're gonna spend some time on this because it's incredibly important. We get it with uh, finding inverses. We do this a lot with exponential functions. We talk about it sometimes on uh, even versus odd and domain. So I need to show, uh, no, sorry, uh, inverse, a lot of inverses, not even odd. So here's how to solve an equation when you have variables in more than one spot on a fraction. Number one, this is a proportion, this is a rational equation, and so we can and need to multiply both sides by the LCD. And we're going to do that. So we're going to multiply by x minus 6 on both sides of our equation, but we're only doing that so that we can cancel out that denominator. We want to be able to do that. And yes, we're going to distribute 2x minus 12 equals x plus 2. Um, in the future, what's going to happen is that we are going to have two variables up here. And I want to start this idea right now uh, so that I can kind of preface your learning when we get way in the future, right? Here it's going to be fairly easy because we're just multiplying both sides by your denominator. But in the future, I want you to look at what would happen if we had a variable here instead of a number. So think about what you do now because this is something you know how to do and then we're gonna apply it later to something you don't know how to do, so please focus here. How you go ahead and solve this, you all know, you all know that you're gonna subtract your x from both sides and you're going to add your 12. Why? Because you wanna get all the terms with the variable you're trying to solve for on one side and all the terms without that variable on the other side. The same exact logic you know right now is going to work later for inverses and later uh, with exponential functions and solving those things. So please keep in mind what we're doing here is you're getting rid of your fraction by multiplication, yes. You are distributing, yes. But then you're trying to group your terms with x on one side and non-x is on the other. Just keep that in mind because it's going to come back at us. So x minus 12 would equal 2. Yes, we add our 12. We get everything that's not an x on the other side. That's x would equal 14. Hopefully I'm doing that right. Um, well, you know what? You could check your word, couldn't you? If you plug in 14, it should give you out 2. So 14 plus 2, that's 16. 14 minus 6, well, that's 8. 16 over 8 is 2. So we know that we're right. We've completed a point. In fact, you can show that. This says, I want you to complete a point. Oops. Where your output value is 2. Have you done it? Yeah, yeah, you have 14. You've completed the point, and that's what that's asking you. For domain, oh, I'm hoping you remember domain. Remember that domain, right now, there's two issues with functions. We have um, square roots, or even roots, and then we have denominators. And if we don't have those, generally our domain's all real numbers until we get the logarithms. So here we go, ah, we don't have any square roots, that looks fantastic, but we do have a denominator. What we know about de denominators is that if denominators equal zero, we've got a big issue. We have an undefined value. And so what the domain is, is the set of inputs that give you defined real number outputs. Well, x equals 6 would give you an undefined value, and so, an undefined situation. And so we say, well, you know what? Yeah, if my denominator equals 0, this is going to create a big problem for me. We talked about it a long time ago, but x equals 6 is not a good thing. It's, it's an input that's not defined. It, or it's an input where the output is not defined. And so we'd say, you know what? We need to disinclude that. 
So our domain is x value such that x does not equal 6. If you forgot about interval vacations a little bit, little bit worse uh, than that. So, so if, if 6 is the only number that doesn't work, I'm disincluding it, then really the domain is from negative infinity to 6, and I'm disincluding that. Remember how parentheses disinclude a value. So you can go up to 5.9999, and then from 6.0001 or whatever to infinity, but you're just disincluding the 6. X-intercepts. X-intercepts are found very similar to, um, to setting your function's output equal to 0, or equal to 2. So we'll, we'll, what, let's see, what's X-intercepts? X-intercepts say, I want your output to be 0. That's how we found them on a graph, and that's exactly how we find them now. It's a little bit easier than this. I'll talk about why in a second, but I need you to understand the idea. An x-intercept is where the height of your function is 0. So if your height of your function is given by your output, set your output equal to 0. This will always give you x-intercepts in any sort of a function. So if we say, I want my output to be 0, well, that is an x-intercept. I want my, wait a minute, here's my function value. So if I set my x plus 2 over x minus 6 equal to 0, this is saying I took my function, I replaced my output with 0. This is saying I want my output to be 0 here. That is where our x-intercepts would come from. Now, why did I say it was going to be easier than this? Well, can you still multiply both sides by x minus 6? Yes. But what is 0 times anything? Well, 0 times anything is, is 0. So if I multiply both sides by x minus 6, it's going to give me still 0 on the left-hand side and x minus 2 on the right-hand side. Listen, when you have a rational function and you're trying to find your x-intercepts, the way that we appropriately do that, by understanding that when you find x-intercepts, you're setting your function equal to 0, really all you have to do is take your numerator and set it equal to 0. Why? Because firstly, your denominator can't equal 0, and if it does, you get some problems. Uh, your numerator is the only thing that can equal 0, and if you multiply both sides by x minus 6, it'd be 0 anyway. So really just set your numerator equal to 0, and you'll find whatever x-intercepts you have, whatever ones are relevant. So if I subtract 2, x equal negative 2, what that's saying is that we have an x-intercept at negative 2, 0. Don't just, don't just think negative 2. Think about how this is an actual point. So on your graph, you'd be crossing the graph at negative 2, 0, wherever, whatever that graph looks like. Last one, the y-intercept. Y-intercepts are always found by plugging in 0, so don't get these two confused. X-intercepts set it equal to 0. Usually it's just a numerator for rational functions, and then we, we solve that. Uh, for y-intercepts, y-intercepts say, hey, you know what, what, what is your if you, what is it, where do you cross the y-axis? Well, well, that's going to be where your x is 0. So if I take my x value of 0 and plug it in, it says, I want you to find the output when your x value, your input is 0. It's going to give you an output that's on the y-axis. That would be 0 plus 2 over 0 minus 6, and that's negative 1 third. Again, this thing is a point. You plugged in 0 you got out negative one-third. That is your y-intercept. I hope that this has made sense and that I've illustrated how to find points from graphs. I know it's, it's fairly basic, but sometimes we get confused on this stuff. Um, and I want you to understand it very, very well. Mostly, I need you to understand the domain and the range idea. The domain is a section of the x-axis that your graph is covering. The range is a section of the y-axis that your graph is covering. This is also very important, this last example. Make sure you understand um, that an input value is asking you to find an output value. Giving you an output value is asking you to find an input value, but in both cases, you're, you're really just completing the points. If I give you an, an input, yeah, plug it in. If I give you an output, you have to set it equal to that output and solve. Uh, finding domain, well, we know our two issues. We know square roots and denominators, so we know that square roots need to be inside positive or greater than or equal to zero. Denominators cannot equal zero, so we set the equal to zero and say, I must exclude that value. Other, any other number works just fine. X-intercepts are, are basically this problem but just say your output is now 0 and not 2. So set your output equal to 0. Okay, my f of x is now 0. Let me solve. Y intercept just plug in 0. So next time what we'll talk about, um, we'll, we'll really go through and talk about even versus odd, some of, some of these other features of functions that are, that are coming up at us. So I'll see you for that.